been talking. Um, season one of The Flight Attendant was such a breakout hit in 2020. Um, what would you say is the main appeal and draw of that show? And when did you start noticing that the show started to take off? I think, strangely enough, our show got stopped inside of the pandemic. So we were filming season one. We went to Rome. Uh, we were filming in Rome. Rome was incredible. That was January, February, February. We came home from Rome. We had made a ton of friends. And like two weeks later, our Rome crew started texting us on WhatsApp. We're all in our houses. So we were like, what are you talking about? And they were like, we are in our houses. Like people are dying. It was crazy. And so we knew the pandemic was coming from our Rome crew. And so I called my parents and I called, I was like, you have to quit your job, stop going to church, cut this out and like get food and toilet paper. <laughs> and um, so that, that was wild, you know, to, to see it coming from across the world. And so I think our show was supposed to premiere that May. We were supposed to finish, premiere in May, and it was gonna be what it was gonna be. But I think when the pandemic hit and we were all in our houses, we ended up finishing the show in like August, September, and then our show premiered over, was it Thanksgiving, I think it was. So we were in our houses, we couldn't travel, we were all watching everything. And I think because our show was like a mystery and it involved travel, I think people like, you know, got lost in it. So we were shocked, right? Like, I don't know what would have happened if the world had kept going as normal, but it stopped and I think we were home and people watched the show. I didn't know that it was a big deal until the award season started, which is like weird to say, but like, then I was like, I was, we like started waking up to like, you know, alerts that our show had been nominated in Kaylee. Well, it's us. nine nominations. One Emmy <laughs> one. A massive hit. Everybody was talking about it. Um, while this show was taking off, you know, so many actors, uh, in this industry like to work, clearly, yes. but not every single one of them is a part of a hit show. How has this show changed your life for you? Have you noticed the changes? I mean, it changes your access to people in the industry and I think the world. Um, I have been a, an, a working actor. I call myself a blue collar actor for many, many years. I was doing commercials, I was hosting, I was doing guest spots and gigs and like everybody else. And I think that when the show took off, people were always like, did your phone start ringing? Did people start offering you things? No, no one has offered me That's anything. That's not the case. No, <laughs> but I started making tapes in my kitchen and I was doing self tapes and, and I, I think what happened is people started watching my tapes. <laughs> so the next job that I got after Flight Attendant was Roar with Issa Nicole, Rae. Nicole Kidman. Yeah, and Nicole Kidman. So like that was, and I knew, I had started to hear um, Issa watch the show and she loved the show. So I knew people had watched my tape and then I got a movie with Reese Witherspoon. And, like it started to be like, I auditioned. <laughs> but you know, like, but it started to be, it started to be like, I think people, when I would show up to the, the set to shoot something else, they would say, I, I've seen you on the show. So that was probably the biggest notice. No one recognized it. We were in our masks. It wasn't like I, I couldn't go to the grocery store, you guys. Like, we could go everywhere. No one knew who we were. Nobody cared. We were just, you know. So it wasn't like that, but it was more access. Well, thanks to your character, Shane Evans, Cassie is now a CIA asset. And uh, during season one, you were a flight attendant that slowly started revealing yourself and in the season finale we find out that you're a CIA agent. Um, where do we find Shane Evans in season two and what are you exploring with your character now? Uh, season two, I think because the world stopped and because the conversations that happened when the world stopped about black and brown people, about the LGBTQ plus community. I think on season two, first of all, I think everyone grew up. Like I, th I look at our show and I'm like, we all look different. I think everybody like grew up. Um, and then I think the conversation inside of the show grew up. Mm. So 
for me, we were now we're dealing with sobriety and we're dealing with, I, I kept feeling like this season was about Shane taking his place in the world. And I think that happened for me internally, right? Like 2020 was about me taking my place in the world. Um, and so I showed up to set, like, it's time for me to take my place in the world. Mm. So I, I hope it's on the screen this season. And I think that there were, for me, I wanted to feel like the story was not just going to be about Cassie, even though, of course, you know, it, it, the, the show centers around her. But I wanted it to feel like when Shane shows up, that Shane is like, no, 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 it ain't about you. Right. Okay, I have a whole life, I have a whole thing that I'm doing, <laughs> and you can't get in my way. That's 2020 on screen, I think. Right. And that's just the energy shift that I showed up to work with. And quite honestly, our cast showed up to work with that. So it wasn't just me, I think there was allies inside of it that are like, I think it's time for Griffin to say something here today. Mm. And it wasn't just me, I think there's a lot of new conversations on the screen. So in season one, as Shane Evans, we find him as a flight attendant, there's a lot of comic relief. Uh, plentiful of comic relief. But then, you stop being a flight attendant and all of a sudden you're a CI agent, you know, killing bad guys. Um, how do you find the comedy inside a more serious role when we're used to seeing you uh, with the jokes, with the humor, and all of a sudden things have to change? How did you manage the balance between trying to keep some sort of the light humor of Shane Evans but also embrace this more, this growth, this more serious aspect to him. Well, first of all, when I started reading the scripts for season two, I was horrified because there, I didn't see the comedy that was so evident right. in season one for me. Mm -hmm. And they're really great on my show. They let me say things. They're like, Griffin, say whatever you want. And then I just say whatever I want. <laughs> Kaylee says whatever she wants. And we just like, you know, the writing is there and we say what's on the page. And then they're like, now do I take and say whatever you want. So improv. Yeah, it's, we're improving at times, but, um, for me, I think, what, I try to get into the drama of it, like Golden Girls is my favorite show. <laughs> and one of the rules of comedy is they, they're not in a comedy, they're in a drama. Blanche is in a drama, she's not in a comedy. So I was just like, right, we have to stay in the drama and of course life is funny at times. Right. And so anytime I could find, and Kaylee and I talked about it all the time, anytime we could find a place to inject comedy, we do it, but it, tried, it had to be rooted in the drama. And so I kept saying, I feel like I'm on Law & Order. Like all of a sudden I'm Mariska. <laughs> like, you know, like I'm just coming in with my badge. Right, you know? right. And I was like, okay, I gotta figure out. I, I have to remember that I am a different representation of a CIA agent. Mm, okay. So I felt a responsibility to like stay me inside of it, you know, to like bring a different version of CIA. I, I hope I got it. I think you got yeah. it. Uh, how would you describe your relationship with Cassie this season? Yeah. Because a lot of season one, from what I remember, there was this concern from you to Cassie. Like yeah. anything that she did, there was this sense of protection, like you were her savior. And clearly we now know at the end why you were her savior, but you were, you were really looking for Megan in season one. Yeah. She happened to be like a secondary focus for you. Where do we find that relationship? Are you guys closer friends now? Uh, or are you trying to be a little bit more distant because Cassie's a little bit of a chaos? Yeah. What's funny is we had so many conversations about this. There, there was a couple. First of all, our writers are brilliant. Um, and they, there was like a line in season two where it was like, Cassie, are you okay? <laughs> and I was like, am I a CIA agent? Don't I know things? <laughs> this lady is not okay. Like, we know she's not okay. You cannot ask yeah. her if she's okay. So Kaylee and I were like, yeah, you can't say that. We have to say something else. And, and so really like dealing with sobriety. I've had friends who have been through sobriety and, and it is so tough. And so one of the things that I've learned from being, watching my friends struggle with their sobriety is there's Al-Anon, right? That's the family and friends. Like you gotta go to therapy too. And I was like, there is boundaries that, that cannot be crossed. And so Shane and Cassie are inside of that tug of war about the boundaries that will not be crossed because Cassie starts to bleed her mess starts to bleed into Shane's life. 
And I think there was a lot of conversations behind the scenes and we tried to get it on the screen about boundaries. Like you will not destroy my life. You will not destroy my career. And I hope it's okay for me to say this, but I also think that that's 2020. Like I just think that like, it was apparent to me that there were boundaries and I had to hold that line. Like you don't get to center yourself here. So that was always underneath. Uh, now, did you have choices. to extract that, or did a director kind of give you a sense of guidance of where that character needed to be? Well, sure. We had Silver, our she's our producing director, so she would, she shot a lot. A lot of times on TV, you get new directors for every episode. We had Silver Tree. She's incredible, and she was like. She shot several episodes, so we started to, she has opinions, you can go to Silver and say, what do we want to do about this? And also Kaylee, I'm working with my boss, who's the executive producer, so Kaylee and I could have conversations about it. Mm. And so that's why I say it felt like it had to be a group decision. And and so, yeah, I mean, I it was some, Rosie and I on the side, we talk it all the time, <laughs> you know, about who we are in this world. And so there was a lot of conversations that I think were welcomed. Um, under the given circumstances of the world, you know? So yeah, it was, it was discussed, for sure. Now, a lot of um, actors today have had to adjust to filming these incredible landscapes with green screen backgrounds. But that's not the case <laughs> in The Flight Attendant. You guys actually shoot in real locations, in this case, Iceland, Berlin, uh, especially, it feels like James Bond, you know, like a uh, uh, type of production. What does it mean for you as an actor to not have Iceland as a green screen background and actually be there in the real location? What advantages or benefits does that offer for you as an actor? And, and I guess for Shane. Yeah, first of all, it's incredible to travel the world under HBO and Warner Brothers. <laughs> it's a different way to travel, ladies and gentlemen. So I, I got to experience that. But, you know, I will, say, I will say that Iceland changed my life. Iceland changed my life. Oh, yeah. I didn't want to go to Iceland. No black person wants to go to Iceland in December. In the, the dead of December, no black person wants to show up to Iceland on December 15th. We're not trying to go there. Um, funny enough, Kaylee and I were like, we were on a group text talking about like, what? Who picked Iceland? Like, we were so not wanting to go there. P.S. Iceland is four hours of daylight in December. So we were like, so we're leaving LA to go in the dark tundra where it's freezing and like, we didn't want to go. We got on the ground in Iceland. It's incredible. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. The people are tall Vikings and they're white and there's not a black person for miles, but it's really quite incredible. Um, but one of the things that changed my life about shooting in Iceland, and we also shot in, as I said, Bangkok last season, Rome, is after 2020, I get to Iceland my first night. I was like, I'm going to go meet someone for a drink. It's like 10 o'clock. Um, and I go up to the front desk and I say, um, is it safe for me to go down the street? I'm like, go in here. And, and this lady looked at me like, what, what do you mean is it safe? I said, well, because it's dark and it's been dark since three. And, it's safe. and she was like, it's safe. Like, no one's going to hurt you. And that is like, if you're American and if you're a brown right. person in this country, you need to know the world is not all operating the way we are operating over here. It Correct. is safe. You can walk down the street in Iceland. No one's going to hurt you. <laughs> so that actually, so as our, our crew is Icelandic and it, and I made friends there, it started a conversation about like who we are in the world. Mm. Like if you have never left the United States, you better go. Mm. You better find out what it feels like to be somewhere where there isn't that history, where you are American and you are not black American or African American or the descendants of slaves. I have nothing wrong with that, I'm proud of it. But it is a different experience to go somewhere where they're just like, you're American. And we like Americans. Mm -hmm. And you can walk down the street, no one's gonna shoot you. Which was my question, is someone gonna hurt me? You know, so I, anyways, that inside of this job, inside of this experience is incredible. It's life changing, it makes you feel like a citizen of the world and it also makes you feel like we have a responsibility to solve those issues in our country. It's like the conversation from 2020 continues. Speaking of, right before we got on stage, uh, you and I had a brief conversation, and you mentioned that this whole experience for you uh, was a hunt for diversity. And looking at diversity today and the way of film and television have adjusted 
uh, post Floyd. Um, how do you think Shane Evans and your character and Rosie's character uh, in the show, how well do you think this contributes to the TV landscape and how does it contribute overall to society? Well, the first thing is that I'm a black, gay, skinny CIA agent <laughs> with like a dreadlock mullet. Like I think it counts in the canon of TV. I didn't see anybody like me when I was growing up. And I certainly didn't see them in a position of authority. My, the early part of my career was a lot of sassy secretary and sassy best friend. And so to have a position on a TV show on HBO Max is, um, I mean, it's life changing for me. And I hope that it impacts the way that we see ourselves on screen. I know Rosie would say something very similar, although she's had a pretty incredible career. Um, but Rosie also sat me down in Rome in our trailer and she read me for filth in that trailer about my responsibility inside of this show. What did she say? Well, I had a question. So we shoot out of order. We shoot out of order and we were shooting the finale, season one, when I come to the door, boom, we were shooting that in episode four position. So I had not read the rest of the show. We were in Rome and they were like, yeah, you gotta be a CIA agent. And I was like, what? And so I had all these questions, and I was like, well, I don't want to ask me. It's like weird, so I don't want to say anything. And she was like, if you don't get in there and ask, they will do whatever they want. You, you are part of this conversation. You have to bring yourself and your life. And it was like, you know, like, people of color, we are. T we just be grateful for your job, and thank you very much. <laughs> and Rosie was like, no, no, you have to contribute. If there's an issue, you have to say, I have an issue with this. What does that line mean? I don't feel like we would say it like that. We have to say it like that. All of that stuff. Rosie read me, and she was right about everything, and I took some of my thoughts to the producers, and they were like, yes, good idea, which I didn't know that they would do. That is the, the brilliance of my experience of HBO Max. It's also the brilliance of having women in power. I have to say it because, like, it changes, and it changed the landscape to have Kaylee and, and Natalie and everybody. Like, it's, it changes silver, it changes the landscape. I had a baby in the pandemic. Congratulations. I had a baby on Monday. They called me on Tuesday and said you have to be in New York on Friday. And I said I had a baby. And they were like, well, then you can't come to New York. We're going to write you out of the episode and you're going to take paternity leave. It ne That's women. Two, two mothers at the top. And they're like, you can't come. We're going to write you out of the episodes. Because that was when you had to come to New York for two weeks in quarantine and da-da-da. It was cr I was going to be gone for two months from my newborn. And they were like, you can't do that, Griff. So anyways, I say all that to say that the, the, it's not just about the representation. For me, I think it's also about what happens behind the scenes. It's not enough to put black and brown people on screen. It has to be happening behind the scenes. It's not enough to put women in front. They have to be behind it changes everything. This event, I don't know if this event would be happening if we hadn't done 2020. I don't know if I would be here or you would be here. Like, I don't know. But I'm grateful for the network for caring about it. Um, a black woman is running Warner Brothers, by the way. Yeah. That happened in the pandemic. Channing, running Warner Brothers. It's a gag. It is a gag. She looks like my aunt. You're like, okay, hello, you're running things. I'm loving that. But that is that is companies putting their their money where their mouth is and really I mean you see you see the characters on our show this season, Margaret and Rosie's relationship, even the LGBTQ storylines, like they don't really go much more than like, we like to dance together. But I kinda love it because isn't that what life is? You don't get the whole story. They do what they gotta do. So anyways, I think those kinds of things, our show reflects the growth of our culture and I, I'm really proud of that. We're, we're very proud of it too. Um, before we uh, finish here, Uh, let's take a couple of questions. So where do we begin? Thank you, Kiara. All right. Let's start with you in the first question. Hi, how are you? My name is Shana. I'm with The Nocturnal. I wanted to know how have you grown as an actor since we're working on this show? First of all, another pair of thigh highs. <laughs> that was the dress code this evening. Um, 
I've become more confident. I trust myself more. I think it's due to my cast and the crew really like allowing me to talk like myself. I've never had to butch up. I've never had to, you know, be anything other than myself, bring myself. So that changes your life as an actor when you realize like you're enough. Um, so that, I just trust myself more and I, and I, I'm not afraid to get involved in the conversation about what story we're telling. I was very afraid before to lose my job or to say the wrong thing. And I really do feel like I can ask, I can challenge, and I can make decisions inside of the creative process that I didn't think I could before. Did this show in particular reinforce that confidence yes, for you? Yes, 100%. First of all, my co-stars, Kaylee is incredible to work with. She is bananas. She's so talented. So we like feed off of each other. The things that we say to each other, like that's our lives on screen. That's how we talk to each other. And same for Rosie and all, like all, we are strangely enough friends. We really are friends behind the scenes and it changes what happens when they yell action. So, so that's part of the confidence. So yes, I think the show has been a direct result of, of that. All right, let's have another question. Hey. Hi, Delena Dixon of DivaGalsDaily.com. Yes. Two questions. Yes. One, how would you like to see your character's personal life play out on screen? And since you talked about fashion in New York City, tell us about your fabulous fashion, because you look incredible tonight. You're my favorite person in this room. I love you so much. Uh, the Okay, I literally I blanked on the first question because as you were, t I beads of sweat. I'm like saying, okay, my par yes, oh right, my personal life. Well, yeah, that thing that you said. Uh, my character's personal life. I watched. I was working on this project. Um, I watched this documentary about fame, and I was watching Debbie Allen talk about fame. And she, it, De get into Debbie Allen. She is a priestess, a high priestess. Debbie Allen said when they were working on fame, she was like, Chad, I know I was gonna get nominated for everything, but I knew I couldn't win. Because those other ladies, they went home with those other ladies. They would not go home with me though. They would not go home with me. So you can't win if they don't go home. And I like, that has never left my brain. So where I would love for my character to go, and we talked so much about this on season two, is I would love to go home with Shane. I would love to see what is really Shane. You'll see some of, uh, of it in the next couple episodes coming, but I would really, you know, the idea of playing CIA, they were like, people, friends and family don't know that you're in the CIA. Is that his real apartment? Is that his real clothes? Like, you don't know how far the gig is going, you know? So I would just really love to go home with Shane. And I really want Issa Rae to play my sister. <laughs> Issa and I talked about it on set. I was like, you gonna play my sister? Yes, yeah. she was like, I'm gonna play your sister. <laughs> Tell him to call me. So I wanna go home with Shane. I wanna, I wanna see the, the full extent of who he is when the doors are closed. Um, fashion. Um, I do my own fashion. I don't have a stylist. <laughs> there is no muse. There is no someone that inspires your sense of taste. Sure, I mean, I'm inspired by every, I mean, I'm inspired by you. Like, I'm looking at them like, okay, we match. Like, I just, you just get inspired. Um, but of course I have, I, one of the things is that you, I just want to get closer to what I want. We're just, we just wear whatever we want. So when I go and look for clothes, I literally just go, if I think it's pretty, I just buy it. I just put it, I just believe it's for me. You know, it's like the Lord sent me this, and I'm gonna put it in. So like, I bought this in Iceland, at like a vintage, I think everything I'm wearing is pretty much vintage, but yeah, I just try to like, I just try to be myself. The journey of an actor, I think, is getting closer to yourself, not getting farther. The ones who get farther, we see them. The ones who get closer, I think Meryl got closer because if you're closer to yourself, it's on the screen. I think Kaylee got closer to herself this season. So anyways, you can see that. Yeah. You can see it. So I just try to be close to myself. <laughs> Let's ask another question. The gentleman in the back. Hi there, Ari Griffin. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. 
Oh, pardon me. Either. So, anyways, my question to you is: Congratulations, by the way, on your role. It is fantastic. Do you find yourself sometimes struggling with these characters you are meant to interpret, or do they come natural to you? Uh, do you reflect yourself in them? Not that this shows on screen under any circumstance. Of course, it does not. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. When I got the job, I auditioned for the show. I did not know that he was a CIA agent. I had no idea. I just had the scene on the train in New Jersey. We're heading to Jersey or whatever, and I, we had that scene. That was my audition. Me and Kaylee had a chemistry week. So I did not know. Um, and when I found out we were filming, I'd gotten the job. I was, we were already filming, and I was like, oh, that's a big whammy. That changes things. So what I wanted to do is not change me, the performance. I didn't want to all of a sudden become, you know, Denzel Washington. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not that good of an actor to be Denzel Washington, but I, I wasn't, you know what I mean? I, I wanted to stay true to why I thought they cast me. And I also thought, well, I'd be a good CIA agent because you'd never expect it. So I should just stay down this, this track. So I didn't really question it so much. I just wanted to be, again, we shot out of order. We were shooting this episode and then this episode, sometimes two episodes at the same time. So I just wanted to try to stay inside of the story. What do I know at this point? What don't I know? But again, I think that it's, it's about being as true to yourself as possible. Like, I didn't want to do something that I had seen. I wanted to do me and hope that you hadn't seen it, you know? And I think that that was, I got some messages on Instagram from like other, A, black flight attendants, black men flight attendants, and they were like, yes, thank you. And then I got a really sweet message from this like, he was like 16 or 17, um, he wrote to me, he was in, he, like he was wearing like feminine clothes to his prom. And like sent me this message and, and it was like moving to me because I was like, thank God, if you see yourself on screen, then somehow you feel like you're validated in the world. So those kinds of things, those people are my muses. You know, I feel like it's, if you're getting it from your community, they see themselves in you or your performance. It's the greatest compliment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,